we look forward to your talk on dirty science. Thanks, Ryan. Thanks, Ryan. Good afternoon. OK, so we're going to start by running a little contest since everybody's in the back of the room. So my new book, Eight Steps to High Performance, just out last month, I will give two copies away to the first two people who make it up to this front row. OK, there we go. So make sure you send me, send me your email. I will get you books out immediately. Thank you. OK, one, super happy to be here today, super happy to be at Hogan. Um, I've been working with Hogan products for almost 20 years, um, which surprises you given that I'm only 25. But starting with uh, my Bank of America days many years ago, I learned about Hogan there, was certified, uh, and then have been uh, really happy to be working with them in my current company, Talent Strategy Group. Uh, not only because I love the products, but I love just the, the mindset around this work and the partnership that you guys have struck up with us on Talent Quarterly is fantastic. So uh, thank you so much for that today. Um, I already did an introduction, so I'll probably skip this slide a little bit. Basically, we do three things at Talent Strategy Group. We're 10 folks around the world. We help big companies to radically simplify their HR practices. So I started with our A's. Um, so we work with a lot of uh, big firms around the world. We do a lot of development work, as uh, Ryan mentioned. We run the Talent Management Institute at UNC, basically teaching line leaders and HR leaders how to be better at things like how do you assess people, how do you develop people, how do you make tough management choices, so really practical training. Uh, we do a little bit of search, and obviously we, uh, we publish. All the work that we do is governed by what we call science-based simplicity science-based simplicity, just what it sounds like. We want to understand the hardcore academic science about how people work and how companies work, and then figure out the simplest possible way to apply that to make both of those groups do better. And here's the good news about science-based simplicity and the roles that all of you are in. Given that you interact with a lot of companies on a lot of people, and you know a lot about them, you have the power to really make companies and organizations good, uh, or ideally great, or even better, incredible. But you also have the power to really mess stuff up. Because you have a lot of interesting and helpful information about people that if people don't understand the right way or is used the wrong way, can really get in the way of somebody's career being successful. And part of the challenge is that everything that you do is based in really hardcore science, kind of the best science out there. Most people who are using your tools have no familiarity and no understanding of that science. Even some of the folks who are buying this and applying it really aren't that sharp. And here's the challenge with that, is it means that they have a lot of information coming at them every day about stuff that should help people be more successful in their organization. A Hogan tool might be one of those, but they're going to hear from all sorts of consultants and books and magazines and conferences, and they're kind of overwhelmed with information. And most of them don't so sort through that information very well to figure out, well, what's really proven to work and what's not proven to work. And when they pick stuff that's not proven to work so well, it can end up actually hurting people's careers. And so what I want to talk about today is the fact that People like me rely on people like you to kind of get that science right. And Ryan talked a bit about my background. When I went off to business school, I had had no big company experience. I wasn't an Iowa psychologist. I had a poli-sci degree. I had never seen an academic journal in my life. And in one of my first courses, it happened to be an organizational behavior course, we had a reading from an academic journal. And I was reading this paper, and I was amazed. I was like, hold it, this, this paper like, tells me all the answers in the first two columns, and then it explains all the stuff. It's like, are there more of these? And my prof's like, yeah, there are about 100,000 in the library next door. I was like, that's amazing. It's like, all, all of you scientists worked in this, this galaxy of ideas I had no idea was out there. It's like, this is really cool. And then I, of course, naturally assumed, well, if this information is out there, Everybody's going to want to, to stay true to this and do exactly what it says and keep it pure and special. And I learned very quickly that's not really the case. And to me, you were kind of you were my guardians of that galaxy. You were kind of the guardians of that science. You were the ones kind of protecting the world out there from doing things they shouldn't do. And especially in the, the area of assessments, there's a lot of crappy assessments out there. 
And again, those crappy assessments can have pretty deleterious effects on people's lives. And so I kind of look to, to folks like you to say, hey, we're going to make sure that we apply this in a really pure way to make sure that we're getting the biggest and best benefit out of it. There we go. And here's the challenge, is there are a lot of folks out there selling people stuff, either well-intentioned or maybe not as well-intentioned, that just doesn't really work. And the average Jill or Joe buying the stuff isn't necessarily a sophisticated buyer. And on my way off frame now, I'm like wandering so far, I forgot. Not too bad, okay. Um, so the average, uh, the average buyer isn't that sophisticated. And what that means is that there are a lot of fads out there in management, which may or may not be true, but are probably affecting people's lives. Now, instead of doing a table exercise, uh, we're gonna do a little audience participation. We'll do more of this, but think of a current management fad or even a trend which you're not quite so sure is proven that you think might be actually um, having negative effects in an organization. So uh, a trend or a fad where you say, I'm not sure that if people actually do that, they're gonna end up better off. What comes to mind around that? Two-minute assessments. Two-minute assessments, okay. So tell me more about what a two-minute assessment would look like. Just very short. Okay. Probably not a lot of reliability, but uh, make big claims about fair price. Okay, so predictive in half the time, bias now. Okay, great, what else? Grit, oh, you got one of my favorites early. <laughs> yeah, we'll talk about grit in a bit more detail. Um, what else? Oh, what's that? Competencies? Competencies. Competencies, okay. Charismatic leadership. Charismatic leadership, great. Oh, wow, you're hitting on all the big ones, okay. Digital leader. Ah. General, oh, wow, you're like setting up the rest of this presentation beautifully. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> yeah, for those for those of us who are massive introverts like myself, the thought of sitting in an open office, I get like flop sweat immediately. <laughs> so you have to interact with people all the time. So yeah, there as you know, there's a lot of stuff out there that Again, some of it well-intentioned, some of it not well-intentioned, but all of it, if you implement it and it doesn't work, has at the do-no-harm level, it just wastes people's time, but at the do-harm level, actually can send people in the wrong direction. If people think they should develop in a particular way with a particular assessment, and that's the wrong thing to do, that can literally hurt their career progress. Hey, Mark, we have another, say, executive presence. Executive presence, okay, love it. So. When I look at the claims that are out there, there are three types of claims I think we all need to stay sharp about. And I would say those three claims are, one is kind of a didn't know claim. So Amy Cuddy and Power Posen. Now, she's gotten merciful, mercilessly beaten up around this, probably a bit too much. Uh, if you're not familiar with power posing, this was Amy Cuddy's claim that if you stood in a certain aggressive way, it would increase uh, I think testosterone and cortisol levels to allow you to feel more confident. Now, there is research about body posture and, and chemicals, so it's not like it was completely out of whack, and she did one experiment where it seemed like that was an outcome. She simply didn't replicate it, so I kind of put that in the didn't know column. There, it wasn't intentionally bad. The fact that she kept talking about it after it was proven wrong, we can argue about, um, but at least she had one experiment that kind of seemed to prove this. So there's what I would call the didn't know category. I didn't know it couldn't be replicated. There is the should have known category. So everybody familiar with the grit book? Most folks, okay. Um, so then you, you know the challenge here, which is she wrote about something where most um, people who have any background in personality would say, sounds an awful lot like conscientiousness. Is it, is it not, no, it's grit? Okay, well, but it really does sound a lot like conscientiousness. And then people write articles saying, no, we assessed it, it is conscientiousness. Now, if, if Angela Duckworth was an HR manager who happened to write a book called Grit, okay, that's, you observed some stuff, you wrote about it, cool. You're a Harvard psychologist. Please tell me that you had studied five factors at some point in your Harvard psychology career, and at some point you said, hey, what I've just discovered feels a lot like grit. 
This was one where you really should have known. That's part of what I think we need to protect people against. And I actually find kind of the community of HR and IO people isn't quite as aggressive around that as I would like. Um, I've unfortunately made a bit of a name for myself, not intentionally, um, just kind of calling out stuff like this because my view is if you haven't proven your stuff, it's up to you to prove your stuff. Don't make claims that you can't back up. And so somebody like, uh, like Angela should have known that grit was conscientiousness. And even in interviews today, she doesn't back it up well when challenged. And then they're just making shit up. Things like strengths. There's absolutely no proof, as many of you know, that focusing on your strengths will do anything more for you than focusing on derailers or any other element of your, your personality or characteristics. Yet Gallup uh, sells this in, I think they're up to about 19 million strengths finders and have sold millions and millions of books. Um, again, my view is there's nothing wrong with this. It's more of a time waster, but the challenge is that my profession, HR, has adopted this as the right thing to do. And this actually is something that I think does harm. If you tell a young high potential, just focus on what you're good at. That other stuff, yeah, no, it might get in the way a little bit, but don't just focus on what you're good at. Nothing's going to derail somebody faster than doing that. And I think this is the other challenge is we need to, we need to be vocal when we find things like this to say, actually, no, that's not proven. And hey, Gallup, you should moderate your claims around it. And, and folks like Rob Kaiser, who I think many of you have probably interacted with, I think he spoke here before, has done a brilliant job flagging this. Um, and it's funny, I actually got an in-person visit from Gallup's general counsel because he wasn't happy with some of the stuff that we were saying. And unfortunately, the, the short, short version of the story was we have a big conference every year for heads of talent management at big companies. And each year we have what we call a cage match as part of that. And in the cage match, we take an idea like strengths two years ago, and we bring in a leading proponent and a leading opponent. And we had Gallup's chief scientist in the room, and we had Rob Kaiser in the room. And by about 30 seconds into the first round, it was really, really embarrassing for the Gallup people because Rob would ask simple questions like, can you point me to one peer-reviewed article? Just one, one that proves anything. Well, we have a lot of internal in-house research. Oh, great, can you maybe show us that privately? Well, we don't like to release any of that. Just fell apart instantly. And so I think we need to do a bit more aggressive challenging in our collective fields to say, look, if you're gonna claim stuff that may have a meaningful impact on people's lives, you really need to back it up or we're going to actively point out that you're claiming stuff that has no proof behind it. Because if we don't do that, the question is, why should they trust us? I mean, we should be kind of collective Hogan and, and folks in, in the consulting industry, we should be trusted sources. And the problem is sometimes the, the view seems to feel kind of like this clip from Animal House. And I'm not sure we're plugged in with audio. Would audio come out of here if I played a video? Uh, Anthony, it'll, I think everybody here will hear it. It'll pick up a little bit. Okay, so from the classic movie Animal House on the topic of trust, Oh, that's not gonna. That's not gonna play loud. I'll, I'll narrate. This is. This is when. Uh, Flounder, the big guy in the middle, uh, lends his brother's car. The fraternity takes it, destroys it, and the quote is, "Hey, you fucked up. You trusted us." <laughs> and that's part of the challenge. Is you know a lot of us in this field, we do stuff, and hey, kind of let the buyer beware. That's your problem. I think we need to raise that bar. Um, we should be the, the trusted advisors around all of this. And here's a few areas where things really go wrong. So in HR field over the past five years, performance management has been a topic that has taken up far more time than it really should have. And the challenge is that all of this discussion got started in an article in the noted scientific and literary journal, Vanity Fair magazine, where they wrote about Microsoft and the downfall of Microsoft at the time, this was 2013, I think, and saying that, well, the downfall of Microsoft was based on their culture falling apart, and their culture falling apart was based on stack ranking people. And while it was an interesting journalistic article, there were no real facts in it, just a few kind of disgruntled employees, yet that got the snowball rolling to say, hey, rating people is a bad thing. And here are all the horrible effects that happen when you rate people. 
And then it was picked up by people like David Rock of the Neuro Leadership Institute with articles like Kill Your Performance Ratings, which said, oh, we witnessed in a MRI scanner that the uh, flight or fight reaction lights up in your brain when people are rated. Interesting, but there's a big difference between saying that and then going all the way over here and saying, therefore, in an HR practice, you should do X. It's like, that's curious, but you can't actually apply it to anything practically. And then HBR got on, the, um, got on the bandwagon and published an article by Marcus Buckingham, back to strengths, um, which said, hey, there's a lot of science that proves that ratings are just grossly inaccurate, therefore you shouldn't use them. Now, because I'm a geek, when I read his site, gee, let's read the site and see what's actually in there. Well, it turns out it has nothing to do with performance ratings whatsoever, uh, and in no way justified anything that he talked about, but no one ever kind of called that out. So things like that, where it's kind of standing out in plain sight, people are just making stuff up and drawing conclusions that don't need to be drawn. I think that's one part of dirty science that we need to be careful of, people claiming things are true and proven when they actually aren't. And then what we found is there's been lots of studies since then just proved that companies who drop performance ratings end up with worse outcomes less engaged employees, fewer conversations, less happy high performers. And it's somewhat predictable, but a lot of organizations had to go the long route around that. They dropped ratings, uh, people were unhappy about it, they lost high performers, and they realized, hey, rating and ranking people actually isn't a horrible thing. So when we talk about the effects of having that dirty science out there, companies make real choices on it. You know, if Intel and Medtronic and ConAgra and American Airlines, a lot of our clients who had gone away from that, we brought them back. But think of the embarrassment if you're the HR leader who has to say, hey, all that stuff we told you was true five years ago. <laughs> well, sorry, it turns out not true at all. So protecting ourselves from dirty science, part of it is saying, hey, if stuff sounds like it's just too easy uh, or there's not real justification behind it, let's kind of raise the bar and ask for a bit more proof generations. So it feels like you're already all on the bandwagon on this one, so I won't spend too long on this one, but people have made a lot of money over the past 10 years uh, dividing people into generations and pretending that they're fundamentally different. Um, we'll, we'll do the quiz anyways, even though you're all probably fairly, uh, fairly good at this. So for each of these three items, I want you to tell me, is this true about millennials? Gen Xers or boomers? I'll ask them in a row and then I'll come back and answer them at the end. So first question, 75% of them have had the same job for three plus years. Is that true about millennials, Gen Xers, or boomers? Raise your hand if you think it's millennials. Raise your hand if you think it's Gen Xers. Raise your hand, boomers. This is a mandatory vote. We'll try that again. Raise your hand if it's millennials. Raise your hand if it's Gen Xers. Raise your hand, boomers. Mainly Gen X. Okay, we'll come back to that one. Second question, 24% of them say that their primary interest is to help solve social and or environmental challenges. Raise your hand if that's millennials, Gen Xers, boomers. Okay, and finally, um, this group most frequently uses their social media accounts at work. Millennials? Gen Xers, boomers, millennials, Gen Xers, Gen Xers. So we love to take the, the easy, uh, kind of the easy sound bite and say, oh, that, that must be those slackers uh, in the younger generations. And most of our assumptions about generations prove not to be true and the good news is there's been lots of science scientific research done on this, and scientists have conclusively proven, conclusively, that millennials are actually people. <laughs> I know, I know, suspend your disbelief, but yes, they've proven they're actually people, which means perhaps they have the same wants and needs as any other people do, meaning at work, they want to have a high quality manager who respects them. They want to have developmental opportunities. They want to work for a company that they're proud of. It's amazing, actually, when you realize that they're people, that some of their fundamental motivators might be the same as other people have. Now, maybe they need to um, realize that motivator in a different way, so maybe feedback looks a little bit different, but they still want honest feedback just like everybody else. 
So again, there's been a lot of what I would call dirty science around this as well. Luckily, there's been a lot of work recently to kind of disprove this, but how many organizations have spent how much money trying to implement a solution to a problem that really doesn't exist? And then, see you guys hit on all the hot ones. Um, this is more fun with an HR audience where they're like, oh my God, I just destroyed my company by doing all these things. So learning agility, um, very smart guys, Bob Eichinger, Mike Lombardo, um, came out with this concept on probably 10 years ago. And basically the claim was, hey, we discovered something new that in addition to intelligence and personality will be predictive of success at work. And for those of us who know a little bit about the science, when somebody says, in addition to intelligence and personality, it makes our ears perk up, but that sounds unusual. The other unusual thing was that every consulting firm seemed to discover this at about the exact same time. There was this kind of global epiphany in the consulting world, and they all found the secret pot of gold at the end of the rainbow that nobody had ever found before. So again, high skeptical, like me, it's like, that sounds a little bit odd, but I'm open, so prove your case. And the challenges were that even though every consulting firm came out with the concept at the same time, they all defined it a little bit differently. So what piece of learning and geology are we talking about here is question number one. If you can't define it consistently, it's pretty difficult to measure it and compare it. There's no academic concept of learning agility. This is a completely consultant constructed reality. There's been some study on it, but it's been pretty darn inconclusive uh, to say the least. And suspiciously, no consulting firm is willing to have their model externally validated. And I have publicly, bless you, um, I have publicly challenged firms around this. We have something called the Efron Prize. When you own the company, you get to name your own prize. Um, and actually it was 50,000, I have upped it to $100,000. I'll pay for any firm, I offered this to Gallup, I've offered it to Corn Ferry. Um, you let us hire a team of independent IO psychologists to review your data and publish it in Talent Quarterly Magazine. We'll pay for all of it. You simply have to allow us to publish whatever we find. Nobody wants to take us up on that challenge for some reason. If you believe in your stuff, that's a great deal. No, <laughs> just say, I don't trust your data. <laughs> I saw you making it up on the way from the restaurant. So, I mean, if people aren't going to kind of put up when they say something, then the question is, do you really believe it's true? Again, I run a commercial enterprise. I understand that sometimes you say, it's kind of true when you know it's sort of true. There's a difference between kind of having a marketing claim and saying, hey, we know that something is fundamentally correct and you should use it on everyone. And the challenge on things like learning agility, and many of you probably experienced this, is that clients want to use it as a predictive factor for selecting and, and deselecting people. I mean, we, we have many clients who have said, oh yeah, no, we, how'd you get your hypo group? Well, we gave them a learning agility test and everybody who scored above an 80% is in our hypo group. Well, you're idiots. I mean, really people, I mean, you just destroyed some people's careers because on an unvalidated instrument, they didn't score at the level, the arbitrary cutoff that you decided was appropriate. That's where dirty science gets harmful, because there's some people who probably had a brilliant opportunity at that company, but because they scored a 79, they weren't determined to be quite as bright as the person who scored an 80 on this. And what else we got here? Let's get a few of these. Strengths, my favorite thing to beat up on. Again, I think you're all probably fairly familiar with this. I don't know, did Rob talk about this when he was here? Rob, talk, Kaiser talk about strengths at all? A long time ago. Long time ago, okay. Um, so Gallup's claim is that if you, uh, you'll be more effective if you use your strengths and develop your strengths because we can't correct our weaknesses, uh, therefore why frustrate yourself with that endeavor? Now to the average Jill or Joe, that just makes sense. Well, yeah, I, I really can't improve my weaknesses that much. Uh, it sure seems like a lot more entertaining uh, way to spend my time to focus on my strengths, so why would I beat my head against the wall the rest of my life? So unfortunately, there's a real strong intuitive argument around this that 99% of people instantly buy into because it just seems to make sense. But the challenge is there's absolutely no research that confirms this at all. And because you're Hogan, you understand that derailers are a really big deal. And there's plenty of research that says that if we don't fix those derailers, it will undercut our career. 
And again, it seems really obvious sitting where you're sitting, but think of the average HR manager where somebody says, here's a strengths book. It's a good thing. It's written by Gallup. You know Gallup, right? Oh, I've heard of that. Okay, that's a legitimate. And the Marcus Buckingham, he's famous. Oh, he's famous. Okay. That's about all the legitimacy they need. And the challenge is then they instantly adopt this and they tell a lot of people who probably have some weaknesses that need to be corrected, oh, don't, don't worry about those, just focus on the stuff that you're naturally good at. And you're all probably also experts on kind of leader emergence versus leader effectiveness. That's the typical example I use. If you're off camera, sorry, um, if you're a, um, if you're an emerging leader, that's great. Emerging leaders have wonderful characteristics of calling more attention to themselves and building good relationships and volunteering for projects, all great things that allow you to emerge as a leader. But what do you do then? Keep doing more of that? If you keep doing more of that, the odds of you ever uh, transitioning into being an effective leader are extraordinarily slim. Um, you're going to need to have fundamentally different strengths over your career to be successful. So just on a basic logic level, it falls apart completely, but in almost every organization that we consult with, and our clients are all big global firms, there are strength finders existing somewhere in that organization. And again, we do a lot of talent review meetings. If you're familiar with a talent review, that's basically you sit around and you talk about the folks in the organization, you rate how far and how fast they can move and what they need to do differently going forward. I have been in hundreds and hundreds of these over my career. I have never heard the phrase, hey, if Susie just keeps doing what she's doing, she'll go right to the top. That's never the conversation. We need to focus on what's standing in people's way, what's kind of holding them back. Okay, so my call to you is, well, was my call, um, I look at you as kind of the guardians of that science galaxy. You're the ones who kind of keep things pure. You're the ones who offer advice that we know is really going to work. And that means not only keep doing the good stuff that you're doing, but be vocal when you know things are being done improperly. Uh, if you see people claiming things that aren't true, ask for the proof. Uh, if you see things that you know aren't true, say it's not true, but we should be kind of very vocal and open about that because that's the way I, that is hopefully the way the community improves uh, and becomes more effective is when we hold ourselves accountable for ensuring that we're all doing the best work in the field. So that's kind of the, the, fast, um, the fast talk on dirty science, but would love to either hear questions on this or given that we do work across the talent management field, happy to talk about anything that happens to do with talent and companies around the globe. So what's in your mind? Yes. So, um, and I'll walk off camera to get my beverage, keep talking. Yeah. So I think we on the consulting team and that interface is directly with you know, direct clients. We do try to be extremely diplomatic when okay. clients tell us things like, well, this program used the Myers Briggs in the past. Um, you know, but we might look at you can come again. Like we take a very diplomatic path to that. We wouldn't tell a client like the Myers Briggs is junk and you shouldn't use it, even though we might know and feel that. Well, perhaps what I would advise you to say as a pair, because I, I tend to be, uh, I have, I think I'm too on interpersonal sensitivity, um, so I may be a little bit low. But what I would normally say is, one, shift the conversation to them. This is a pretty important program, isn't it? Yeah. And you've worked a long time, right? Yeah. And, and probably CHRO was probably really interested in the outcome. Yeah, okay. So you want to make sure it's absolutely right. You wouldn't want to be embarrassed by it. So one, let's shift it back to them and then say, look, if we rank kind of the right answers, let's kind of talk about where things like Myers-Briggs fall. They don't care about validity or they don't, they don't understand any of that. Simply, look, in the order of right, let's talk about kind of it's Hogan and there's a bunch of stuff. There's a bunch more stuff and a bunch more stuff. There's Myers-Briggs down here. And just help them understand, hey, there's, it's like I call it, it's a Cosmo quiz. It's fine. It's entertaining. Hey, great. How do you score? But... You know, if you're going to make decisions based on people's, based, make decisions that influence people's lives, we just suggest that you go with something a little bit better. So I think there's a way of kind of damning it with faint praise of 
nothing wrong with it, but let's suggest that it's not appropriate for this level of leader. If you simply want to introduce people to the fact that we can slice people into different personalities, that's fine, but it's probably more for a supervisor. And really just, I find, unless they understand the science, it's, it's an absolute waste to have that conversation. I would much more sell aggressively, but I think you, I think you can sell aggressively and then have people not understand that they're using the wrong choice. I think you need to somehow also subtly point out, look, personally, I wouldn't use it, and I wouldn't use it because the science that I believe in isn't backed up by that tool. You can make your own choice. In other words, you're an idiot if you do it. Um, but you know, we like our characteristics of our test for these reasons. So kind of sell hard in your tools, but I think also in whatever appropriate Hogan-esque way, dismiss those tools as fine, but I probably wouldn't do it myself. Of course, so sure, and, and that question was about if somebody, if a client says, hey, we like tools like a Myers-Briggs, um, and at Hogan, we don't want to slam at our people's products, um, how do we balance that conversation appropriately? What else? Kind of across, across the talent field, doesn't have to just be the assessment side of the world. Yeah, I think competencies have done more to devalue HR over the years than anything else we've done. Um, I mean, we took these from something that was originally developed to be a job analysis tool, and we decided it was the panacea for any problem that ever hits HR. And while I've rarely seen a technically bad competency model, most of them are absolutely, you know, a professor would give you an A+, plus. most of them are grossly impractical. Uh, they're artificially structured, so you know, why does every competency have three bullets underneath it? It seems odd that it would just naturally emerge that 38 competencies would all have three bullets underneath them. So they're artificially structured, and at the end of the day, they're just grossly unhelpful to the people who they're intended to serve, which is the average Jill or Joe who simply wants to know, how do I succeed around here? So I think we have a larger, I'll start up here, the larger problem is they're just useless in most organizations, and most managers roll their eyes at them. HR loves them, but nobody else does. That's starting point number one from a problem perspective. Then just getting down to the more technical level of your question, they're not valid at all in most cases. Um, and they've never been validated. And it doesn't mean they're wrong. I would guess they're probably 70% correct because they're based on smart people's observations in the company. Um, and in most cases, you're not gonna get sued if they're wrong. And so validation is, nice but not critical. Um, I'm more concerned about the fact that competencies substitute many organizations for simply telling you in, in a very direct way, hey, you're going to win around here if you do A, B, and C. And these are all wonderful things that may help you develop those, and maybe we should leave those over with the, with the training people to help. But if you're going to win around here, three things matter, and here's what those three things are. So the validation part is, I think, helpful. I have a much larger problem just with if competencies are the way that we're supposed to explain to people how you win around here. It's about the most complex, convoluted way to, to have that conversation. What we advise companies is we typically will come up with four brief statements from the executive team that capture exactly that, which is if you're sitting down day one with a um, a university grad who says, I want to be CEO of this firm as quickly as possible. You tell me the four things that if I do them, I'll get there faster than anything else. Average smart leader is going to be able to say, okay, well, around here, like it's this and this and this and this. That's what people really need to hear. And is that validated? Nope. Um, but it's probably true. And the, the people who hear that will probably understand that and, uh, and absorb it much more easily than they ever will a competency model. So that's the very long answer to a short question. And sorry, the question was around, uh, well, it's kind of backwards way to do that. Uh, the, co the question was around um, competencies and how they're validated and applied in organizations. What else? I know you got more questions. Yes, Michael. What do you anticipate being the next big fad? Uh, Michael Sanger asks, what do I anticipate being the next big fad? Um, 
oh, I don't know, 12 months, but um, I think, and it's already been out there, but I think it's going to get even worse, is Neuro Anything. Um, and actually, there has been really cool experiments showing that you put the word neuro in front of things and people find it to be a more believable uh, answer. Um, so we're, it's kind of like people, and same thing, people who speak with a British accent are found to be more believable. It's the same thing. It's like, you, you can't do anything about it, mate. But um, so I think neuro, that's, that's a great British accent. Don't laugh, it's a perfect British accent. Every British person I know sounds just like that. Um, so I think that is part of the challenge is that we, we're up against things that you, you can't even fight. I mean, and part of this is uh, people like HBR are printing half this stuff. I mean, they printed an article on Grit last month. I wrote to my editor there. And it's like, it was a WTF note. It's like, you just published my book where I call out Grit specifically as fake science that you shouldn't pay attention to. Then you publish an article on it. Um, so I think the, the neuro piece is, is promoted science plus business publishes a ton of, of David Rock stuff, and I think that's half the challenge here is that you have legitimate sources who the average manager is gonna believe. Why shouldn't they believe Science with Business or HBR? But I think there's gonna be more neuro stuff coming out. Oh, we saw this part of somebody's brain light up, therefore you should do exactly X, where any neuroscientist worth their, uh, their degree says you simply can't extrapolate. We don't know the brain anywhere near well enough to know what lighting up over here actually means other than that's the center that may control that particular uh, that particular emotion. So I think, unfortunately, neuro is uh, is going to get in the way. Yes. What do you think about gamification, and do you think that's actually going to work tomorrow? Yeah. Um, questions about gamification is it worthwhile? Um, I normally know a lot about most things in the field. I don't really know much about that. Um, from the articles I've read in the Wonderful Talent Quarterly magazine. Um, I understand it's not that great, but that's unfortunate. I have zero firsthand experience with that. What about more generally then, like can you experience taking priority over solid experiences? Um, tell me more. So the question was around candidate like, experience. Like taking, like, we want it shorter, we want it more fun, we want people, we want people okay. to engage, we don't want people to leave in the middle of a customer, so we want to have as many people as possible in the future. Sure. Um, so the question was, um, kind of playing off the um, gamification just around candidate assessments, how do we make sure that they are um, seen as a little bit more engaging and entertaining so that candidates uh, kind of stick to the whole thing. Um, I would go back to the basic validity question. Um, if we improve there's more validity from that, cool. Or if we improve just practically, more people st stick around longer and actually take the assessment and therefore that reduces our hiring cost, cool as well. But it feels like um, just another shiny object that we in HR are chasing. And we love our shiny objects. We do love our shiny objects because it's really boring doing things that work forever. Um, so we like to say, well, that's worked forever, but maybe something else would work. And so we go after stuff like that. Um, speaking of complete ignorance of the topic of um, gamification, I would suggest there's probably a lot of that. If there's a little bit of enablement of the process, if it, was, if it was clunky and heavy and slow before, great, let's make it less clunky, less heavy, less slow. Maybe let's not pretend that somehow we're revolutionizing the art of selection by doing that. But do you have a lot of clients asking for things like that? Like, oh, I don't want an assessment that's longer than you know, 30 minutes total. Or, yeah, again, we do a very small piece of our work's assessment, so we don't even get that many questions around it. And again, we're pretty direct with folks where, again, we're, we're Hogan people. If they come to us and say, hey, we want something that takes 10 minutes and it's super valid. We're like, cool, you should look around for that. Uh, because we're not, we're not gonna give you anything. And again, we're, we're very transparent. We, we believe we know what works. We're gonna tell people, here's what works. And if you don't like our advice, there are a thousand other consulting firms to go to to get advice that, that you want. Or this. Um, so the question is, are there, in certain trads or, trends or fads, uh, self-fulfilling prophecy? Um, give me a little more, what would an example be in your mind? Um, just, I don't know, like a spat around, you know, like a performance appraisal, appraisals and how they work around uh, job satisfaction, you know, saying that one factor is too bad. 
uh, so uh, great, great point. Uh, performance appraisals. If we so let's eliminate ratings because people hate performance appraisals. Okay, we eliminate them. Who's going to love performance appraisals? Low performers. Because who didn't like the rating in the first place? Low performers. Performers love nothing more than being told they're high performers. Um, and but high performers are a small percentage of the population. So self fulfilling prophecy definitely comes in. Hey, I'm a low performer. You eliminated ratings. What do I hear now? Hey, you had a great year, Mark. Yeah, I'm a lot happier. So yeah, I think to your point, there could definitely be self-fulfilling prophecy because we do things for the wrong reasons, then we measure the wrong people to see if they're satisfied with it. What else? Mark, how much request do you get from clients around predicting future leaders? And how do you have that conversation? Yeah, um, so we're purists around that, meaning we're going to go back to intelligence and personality, but we're also big fans of uh, fit with future strategy. So we do a lot of helping organizations understand kind of where in the, the predictable organizational life cycle are you? Are you more entrepreneurial, more operational, more focused on efficiency? Uh, and looking at kind of classic strategic life cycle, and our view is kind of the large extracting from person or organization fit, hey, you're probably going to succeed in the future if you fit with where the organization is going. Can we define the four, maybe five characteristics that define the future of our organization and add that in as an additional variable? I wouldn't say it's any way valid. Uh, I would say it's pretty close to being correct in that um, if we can only predict about half of people's success with intelligence and personality, it leaves a big open gap. Um, I think a lot of that is the, not the culture fit piece, but the kind of fit with the future needs of the organization. And so that's, that's typically our answer for them is, hey, let's, let's do a cognitive, let's do some Hogan's, and let's figure out where your organization is going and the three or four differentiating characteristics that we can assess against. Yeah, it is, um, and let's walk off camera to get a beverage. Um, we, do a, um, we do a course called Talent Management Institute for Leaders, and one of the things we do there is we you know, do a little bit of mapping and where are you going. And no one ever says that what they need in the future is in any way related to what they need today, uh, and they all say they're going to be a fast-moving entrepreneurial company in the future. I mean, seriously, and, and we'd be working with like a, a natural resources company. It's like, you suck oil out of the ground. How fast moving do you plan to be around that in the future? Um, yet they will always go in that direction and there's always a massive gap. Now part of that, to be honest, we play off of because it gets them to actually do something that they might not do otherwise. But the destination they say is the future is the same destination they should have been going for 10 years ago. They, they just never got there. So I think part of that is the novelty of, oh, things must need to be different in the future. Therefore, we'll do a bit of self-fulfilling prophecy around let's Let's create some big words that describe the future in a different way than they describe the past. Um, but most of the times what we hear are people need to be more innovative and they need to be more open to other ideas and collaborate more. Like, well, that's never been needed in the past, has it? Okay, cool, we'll, we'll try and build that for you. Are we stagehand? <laughs> Normally, I don't like people touching me during the presentation, but... <laughs> We've known each other. Before. Yeah, about to say, we're friends, it's okay. Other questions, thoughts about anything talent-related? The big unanswered question in the, in the field that I work in is still around potential. That is the, I mean, we know most things about how people succeed at work and you know, goal setting and, and all that good stuff. Uh, potential and the ability to accurately predict potential is still the big unanswered question. So the, the question was around um, kind of what, what's coming in the future and, and that, that feels like uh, if we could get even 5% closer to that answer, it would have tremendous value to organizations. Because again, most right now, most organizations don't even use any type of assessments to predict potential. And I think if we could come up with a more holistic answer around that, it would be amazingly helpful. Uh, because no one's even really trying to sell it that hard. I mean, Corn Ferry's trying to push learning agility, but um, that, that's not even being used that well. So I think if you could make any headway towards understanding 
potential, even if it's outside your core, your core work. So again, if it's about fit with strategy or something else, but just dig into the, okay, there's 50% variance that we just don't know. Um, how do we even chip away at a little bit of that? Um, I don't know it well enough to actually speak to it. I, I took it when it first came out, back when uh, uh, Tomas was here. Um, but again, I'm not an IO psychologist, and so I didn't look for like properties around it. My view was, that's cool, and does it work? Um, and it felt like it was pretty interesting, but I don't know the, um, the science behind it well enough to be able to offer an intelligent comment on that piece of it. <laughs> Do you have a question? So maybe something that was, uh, uh, the question was around, have there been fads that I actually thought were kind of helpful or productive, yeah. or maybe that emerged into something more legitimate? Yeah, or that we should use it more. And I like to show you the actual new standard. Yeah, well, I would go back to the neuro piece. I think there's going to, I look at neuroscience the way that I think we probably looked at personality 50 years ago, which is, I think there's something here. Let's keep digging into it. But personality went through massive ups and downs in terms of legitimacy. Uh, and I think that the neuroscience needs to go through that same life cycle. I think there's probably a ton of cool stuff that we'll learn once we even know how to look for stuff. I'm not even sure we know how to look for stuff right now. Um, so I actually think there's a ton that can be learned and even uh, a ton of things that can be done to increase productivity. I mean, maybe, maybe we'll learn that pharmaceuticals are actually going to be the best productivity in, increase in the, in the world once you understand how the brain works better. So I do think neuro has a ton of potential. I think we need to take the, the faddishness out of it and pay attention to the people who are doing really serious and, and good quality work, but just recognize there's gotta be a life cycle for this stuff. I mean, it's taken us 50, 60 years to figure out personality. I mean, five factor only came about, what, 20 years ago that we all finally agreed on this thing? Uh, and now we're dealing with a human brain? So let's, let's let it evolve. Pushing, is the mindfulness movement pushing? Um, if I can connect the neuro mapping to my mindfulness coaching. Could be. mindfulness people bring up, there's no real neuro evidence. I don't know if they're latching on to that or if they are striving for that. Yeah, I think, here's what I find that in the mindfulness piece, and I, I was in India a couple weeks ago and somebody brought up the mindfulness, and I said, look, the good news about mindfulness is mindfulness has been proven to do exactly what it claims to do, which is to make you more relaxed and focused. I mean, it actually does what it says it will do. Cool. But it doesn't do anything at work. And the science is clear. They've proven it doesn't do anything for you at work. And that's one where, again, the average lay person is going to say, well, wouldn't the more focused and relaxed person be a higher performer? Well, yeah, sounds obvious. That's why we have science. If you test that assumption, you see if it's true. Turns out, no, it's not. Um, so I think there are people pushing mindfulness, but I do find, and this goes to kind of what's your agenda at work? There are a lot of people in our field who have what I would call a humanistic agenda at work. Nothing wrong with the humanistic agenda, but it's really focused on let's make sure people are here and happy. I have a capitalistic agenda. My capitalistic agenda is I want companies to be massively successful because if they are, then all of us do better. And I think part of the, the mindfulness challenge is I think a lot of those folks um, genuinely and, and have a heartfelt belief it's the right thing to do and they're just kind of projecting, therefore it must be good for the organization. And again, there's just no science that, that suggests it is right now. But again, the good news is it does exactly what it says it does. You'll be more relaxed and focused if you're more mindful. You can figure out if that helps you be more effective at work or not. What else? Sure. Um, my favorite client was and remains to this day a company called Abvi. Some of you may have heard of Abvi. They make Humira. If you've never seen a Humira commercial, then you've. Do I have an Abvi person? <laughs> well, there you go. I will. <laughs> I will tell you more. I will tell you more. Um, Here's, first of all, here's why I like AbbVie. Um, and maybe not from the assessment side, because I don't, I, I know they're big Hogan clients, but I'm not sure how, exactly how they use you. Um, 
in my field, what, what we love to do is we love to solve big problems, and big problems means they have many facets that all interact, and the challenge is that in most organizations, they don't want you to play with more than one facet. It's like fixed performance management. It's like, okay, we can do that, but it pulls on all these other levers, and unless we fix all these other levers, you're not gonna get the lift. And you still do some of that work, but you kind of realize you're not gonna get much out of it. I started working with Abby when they split from Abbott five, six years ago, something that period. And what they've done is we've worked with them in laying out the entire roadmap for how to transform talent, from how do you transform the culture, working with the senior team on getting out of line talent philosophy, and really just moving, kind of moving down the road, doing all what I would call the right things to, to shift their culture in the direction they wanted. So um, I, did you work with Abbott at all? Okay, so the contrast is stark. Abbott was a place where it was top-down management and top-down management like, you'll do what I say, and that's the way it is, that level of top-down management. Um, it was a culture where if you screamed at people, as long as you didn't scream too loud, it, it was fine. Um, almost no differentiation, so if you had a great year, you were at 105% of bonus, and a bad year, you were at 95% of your bonus. And when Abby split off, the senior team said, we want a fundamentally different company, and that's easy to say, very difficult to do when everybody's simply moving over from the old company. And what I really like about what they've done and why they're my, my favorite client is because they have very systematically moved down the road and kind of checked every box that I would want a company to check to transform the culture into what they say they want. Now, are they perfect? Nope. And, and they'll admit, hey, we, they, they don't think they're anywhere near as far as they've they don't think they've gotten as far as I think they've gotten, but I've seen hundreds of organizations do this, and, and they've made meaningful shifts in that culture in five years that most organizations sometimes never get to. And it just, it's not been doing anything exciting or different. They've done nothing exciting or different. They've done basic things like, well, if we want people to feel more differentiation here, what are our differentiation levers? Well, performance management, and comp okay, great, let's fix those. I mean, it was really almost like workmen application of the science. Um, nothing flashy, no fads, but I think it's really shifted that culture uh, in, a, in a positive way. Again, still lots of work to do. Now, they may be jerks on the assessment side, I have no idea, um, but they do believe in assessments, which is a, uh, which is a good thing. Uh, question is, have I ever fired a client? Yes, I have. Um, a Silicon Valley client in the hardware space, not Apple, I probably wouldn't fire them. Um, they, they called us in to do a training assignment um, on performance management, and then they gave us almost line-by-line -line instructions, and that's just not the way that we work. It's like, well, actually, I'll, I won't make this too long, although I could. Um, we have a series of cartoon characters that we use in our training here at company, and we want you to insert those cartoon characters in how you train. Like, no. <laughs> well, no, it's, every training program has these, like, that's freaking stupid, and we're not going to do it. And it went on for a while. It's like, well, we hot. So yeah, that, that client I fired. Most of the time, we're very fortunate that we try really hard to put out enough messages about who we are and how we work that our work is almost all inbound, meaning they, they kind of know how we work and how we think. And so we don't get too many fundamental misfits of people saying, hey, we'd like you to do X. And we say, well, we're a Y shop, so why would you call us about that? So most of the time it doesn't happen. Uh, occasionally you just have, I mean, we all have difficult clients where they say they wanted one thing and then it turns out they want something else and they're just difficult people. Uh, but we're fortunate most of the time people know us well enough that they say, hey, we know what you do and we want some of that stuff. Um, and we're, we're a super transparent shop. I mean, we're really honest with people. If, if things are off the wrong foot a weekend, we're gonna say, hey, you know, normally client engagements in the first week feel like this. This one's felt like this. Let's fix that right now. But do, I, we just learned the hard way. It, the longer it goes on, the worse it gets. What else? Talent, people, assessment, strategy, global. Uh, so the question is, we were having lunch, we were talking about um, my experience is increasingly that company culture trumps country culture. Company culture trumps country culture, meaning 
Um, if I'm working for BMW in China, it's going to feel more Germanic than it is Chinese because processes are getting so global that the folks in Munich want people in China to complete things the same way that people in Munich did and the same way that people in Sao Paulo did and the same way that people in Brussels did. And so it, when I started in this field 20 years ago, there was a big emphasis on country culture. Everything has to be focused on com country culture and they're all unique and different and power distance and all this. And while those are still certainly valid things, what I found is that if you understand the company really well, that's probably gonna be 70% of the variance and there's gonna be a bit of cultural overlay on top with the exception of a few places, Japan is still completely out there uh, in terms of the country culture dominating. Um, but most of the rest of the world, I'm finding um, a lot of homogen uh, homogeneity. There we go, there's a word in there, similarity. Um, in terms of processes and approaches, and a lot of it is because we all read the same books and we all listen to the same gurus. So it's gonna be difficult for us to have fundamentally different ideas. I mean, in HR, we all read Dave Ulrich, and so we all think, well, that's kind of the baseline. And so most of the solutions don't stray too far from that. So just an observation, you might have different observations. I'd be curious to hear that, but I am finding a lot more uh, similarity around the world in terms of how people approach solving talent and people problems than I would have expected to 20 years ago. Well, I'm going to call us to a close here. Okay. Thank you again so much, Mark, for coming. We really appreciate it. Uh, Thank you for the invitation. I appreciate it. Thank you.